Good morning class, you're welcome to today's lecture on commercial law. Uh, in our last class, we are looking at terms in the contract of sale of goods, and we identified that there are certain terms that apply to a contract of sale of goods uh, in terms of uh, conditions and warranties. Uh, we actually looked at the fact that uh, where a condition is breached, the parties will or the innocent party will have a right to repudiate the contract and where it's a warranty the innocent party will have a right to damages and then we also talked about exclusion clauses and the use of exclusion clauses and also talked about the limitations on the use of exclusion clauses through the rule of construction of fundamental terms now today we'll be looking at implied terms in a contract or sale of goods now when we say a term is implied it means that uh, that particular term was not a term which the parties had expressly agreed to uh, in the course of actually entering into that particular contract so if for example the contract is in writing you would not see this particular term actually stated or these particular terms actually stated in the contract or if the contract was verbal the parties may not necessarily have stated you know verbally in the course of uh, you know negotiation that these particular terms should apply but these terms apply by virtue of the operation of law so in sense that even though the parties have not articulated that these terms should apply however the law has uh, has actually implied these terms into every contract of sale of goods but be that as it may we did see in our last class looking at section 55 and we said that the parties have the right to exclude these terms so um, all the terms uh, implied by law can be excluded but where the parties are silent these terms will actually apply so uh, if there is no express exclusion of these terms it means that these terms actually would apply to the contract or sale now uh, prior to uh you know the uh the the, the uh, insertion of these terms into a contract of sale uh, there had always been um a maxim you know that operated within commercial palace which is uh the, which actually means uh, the buyer should take care a uh, caveat emptum so that that particular maxim had always applied you know to commercial uh, transactions so uh, what actually this maxim implies is that after a buyer has purchased a good he cannot turn back and begin to complain about either the quality of the goods uh, that he has purchased or either the fact that the goods do not fit the purpose for which he requires the goods uh, he cannot you know subsequently reject the goods on those basis uh, because uh, the moment the contract is concluded it means that uh, the buyer has no recourse if there is any defect in the goods so it's the, what this particular um, doctrine or this particular uh, maxim actually did is to put the obligation on the buyer to ensure that the goods actually meet all his desired specification so if he desired a particular quality it was the buyer's responsibility to see that the goods actually meet those um, that particular quality it was not the responsibility of the seller to see that the goods actually meet the, uh, that particular quality so it, before the conclusion of a contract the seller the buyer should be able to uh, determine uh, you know uh, whether the goods actually meet the quality uh, for which he requires it or be, if uh, the goods actually meet the purpose for which uh, he requires it now this particular scenario may be difficult in many instances because uh, sometimes you could have uh, transactions that are done over long distances uh, and uh, basically uh, where uh, is a buyer may be purchasing goods on the trust or in reliance in this or in the judgment you know of the seller uh, in relation to those goods so if for example the buyer wants to uh, purchase goods that are uh, he requires for a particular purpose but does not know which goods actually are suitable he may rely on the judgment of the seller in order to purchase those goods and also you may find out that such um, 
in order for him you know to determine whether the goods actually fit those purposes and that particular purpose he will have to use those goods and if he has used those goods probably you know it you know after the sale you know he won't have the ability to return the goods or reject the goods um, subsequently or oh, where you have goods that have latent defect that means hidden defects uh, which could not be observed by the buyer at the time of the sale if after maybe using the goods those defects begin to uh, become apparent uh, the seller or the buyer sorry will not be able to reject the goods so you could have a lot of situations where uh, the uh, buyer would actually be shortchanged, you know, as a result of this, but the application of this maxim. So the courts began to put some exceptions to the application of this maxim, uh, especially in relation to the sale of goods. And these exceptions are w is what has become um, the what we know under the Sale of Goods Act as implied terms. So these are the terms that have now uh, been codified and uh, actually apply in fact into every contract of sale by virtue of the Sale of Goods uh, Act. Now these terms uh, cover a range of matters and uh, they cover issues in relation to time, uh, it covers issues in relation to title, it covers issues in relation to description, uh, issues in relation to fitness for particular purpose, merchant for quality and uh, sample. And we'll look at each of these issues uh, one by one and see what pro what the law provides in relation to these issues. Now, the first issue we'll be looking at is uh, the implied term as to time. Now, in every contract, uh, parties have certain obligations to carry out, you know, in furtherance of that particular co contract. For example, a um, seller has an obligation to deliver goods. So uh, that's an obligation that needs to be done. And a buyer has an obligation to pay for the goods. Uh, that's another obligation that needs to be done. So you could have, uh, and then there could be other, uh, you know, additional uh, obligations that may be um, imposed on either parties by virtue of the contract. For example, if uh, the goods are going to be uh, shipped from one uh, place to another, so if uh, the contract involves a carriage by by ship or by by road or so on, uh, probably someone has to arrange for the shipment. Someone has to arrange for maybe the road carrier or if it's going to be carried by train, somebody has to arrange for the transportation by train. Now, all this may be time bound in the sense that uh, parties may agree maybe payments should be made at a particular time or parties may agree that um, that the goods uh, should be transported at a particular time or parties may agree that the goods should be delivered at a particular time so there could be all these obligations that could have certain time specifications you know in relations to performance now the prop the, the question that arises uh, in relation to time is that where these the uh, these obligations are time bound by the contract that means the parties have specified a particular time in which uh, these acts should be done so for example if parties have specified that payment should be done on a particular day or if uh, pa parties have uh, specified that uh, or that uh, uh, that delivery should be done on a particular day or that uh, a particular uh, day on a particular day or at a particular time a particular party should nominate uh, the transport company that will transport the goods so sometimes you could have uh, an obligation to nominate uh, what good which transporter will actually transport the goods so probably the buyer the seller may tell the buyer to nominate what transport company he should deliver the goods to and tell him the time in which that nomination should be done so there could be several uh, several uh, obligations in that contract of sale that may uh, where parties have uh, de determined that th those obligations should be performed at a particular time now what does the law have to say in relation to these obligations that are time-bound? 
where parties fail to meet the, the obligation within the time stipulated by the contract, uh, would the innocent party have a right to repudiate the contract? Or would it just be something that uh, the innocent party can receive a compensation in form of damages? Now, let's look at Section 10 of the Sale of Goods Act. Section 10 of the Sale of Goods Act says, subject to a contrary intention, stipulation as to time of payment and not of the essence of a contract of sale. So what does this particular uh, section say? It says that except the parties have made it essential, except there is an express term in the contract that makes time of payment essential time of payment is not of the essence of a contract of sale so in the sense that if it's not of the essence it means that you know it's not a fundamental term you know when we were talking about fundamental term we said uh, terms that are essential to the main purpose of of, of the contract so where a term is not of the essence it means it is not essential to the main purpose of the contract it's merely collateral so paying at a particular time paying at a particular time is not essential that's what the law is saying it's not essential to the main purpose of the contract it is merely um collateral it's merely collateral to the main purpose so if there is a violation of of, of a stipulation as to time of payment uh, the only remedy that will be available to the buyer or to the seller uh, probably will be damages that means he will can recover the, the the amount of money and also claim for damages for the breach of that particular term but he cannot repudiate the contract in the sense he cannot go and ask the the seller uh, to actually uh, the buyer sorry to return the goods if the goods have been delivered or he cannot say he's refusing you know to sell you know to to, de to deliver the goods to the the, the the buyer and decides to sell it to somebody else uh, because uh, the time of payment you know has not uh, was was not actually complied with except there is a contrary uh, in intention so it means that parties can intend or can expressly um uh, expressly state that they intend that the time of payment should be of the essence of the contract so there may be contracts where parties may state that uh, failure to pay within a particular time will repudiate the contract so if that particular statement is made, you know, in the contract of sale, it means that time is of the essence because the parties have made it of the essence, you know, of that contract. So if there is no stipulation, so what this means, therefore, is that for time to be of the essence, it must be expressly stated. There is no implied term by law that time of payment will be of the essence. So no party, if the parties are silent, no party can say that the law can rely on the Sale of Goods Act to say that the time of payment will be of the essence. The only uh, basis upon which uh, time could be of the essence is if there is an express term making time, a uh, time of payment to be of the essence of the contract so uh, that should be taken um, uh, 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 we should actually take note of that then you know I did mention that there are other obligations that could be performed for example delivery uh, maybe appointment or nomination of maybe a transporter or the shipment of the goods or whatever there could be other obligations now the law also uh, makes provisions for that it says whether any other stipulation as to time is of the essence of the contract or not depends on the terms of the contract so if any other stipulation will be of the of essence it will also depend on the time of the contract so all the stip other stipulations relation to uh, the, you know maybe delivery um, in relation to shipment, you know, in relation to nomination of um, a particular, uh, a, a, you know, a particular transporter to transport the goods, all those will depend on the terms of the contract. Now, the courts have recognized that 
certain in, in respect of certain obligations uh, in relation to uh, the performance you know of a contract uh, time will be of the essence for example delivery and the courts have recognized that failure to deliver within the time stipulated by the contract you know will be uh, a time will be of the essence and the party uh, who who, um, the party, the innocent party, uh, will have the right to repudiate the contract. Also, shipment, uh, the failure to ship within time, uh, will also uh, give the innocent party the right to repudiate. And then maybe opening of letters of credit in terms of uh, maybe an international contract where letters of credit are used, uh, it will be of the essence of the contract. So there are cases, you know, that are bound to that effect. Now let's move to the second. Uh, term which is uh, implied terms as to title now this is provided for under section 12 of the sale of goods act and what section 12 uh, actually provides is that there is uh, what section 12 uh, actually provides is that uh, there is an implied condition that the seller uh, has a right to sell the goods or in the case of an agreement to sell that he will have a right to sell at the time uh, when property is to pass then also it goes on to say uh, that and there is an implied warranty that the buyer will have and enjoy quiet possession of the goods and also uh, it says that there is an implied warranty that the goods are free from any charge or encumbrance not disclosed or known to the buyer before or at the time when the contract is made now this particular uh, section actually deals with uh, the title to to the goods. Uh, this particular section uh, of section 12 actually deals with uh, title. Now, what this section actually provides for is the fact that uh, the seller has a duty to pass a good title, you know, to the buyer. And uh, when we talk about title, we are talking about uh, the general property. You know, when we talk about property, we are talking about ownership. So he should be able to pass the right of ownership of those goods to uh, the seller. So uh, that's basically what we mean when the act is uh, refers to the seller's right to sell. So that right to sell means that the seller should be able to pass the general property in the goods. You know what we when we were dealing with our definition you know uh, of the sale of goods we talked about the fact that um you know there is that the, the the seller transfers or agrees to transfer property and we said that there is a transfer of property when there is a sale so uh when you talk about someone having the right to sell we are talking about him having the ability to transfer property because you cannot sell without the transfer of property so uh, basically, uh, the right to sell deals with the right to pass property uh, in the goods. Now, um, looking at uh, this particular section, uh, where, for example, the seller does cannot pass property or do not, does not have the right to pass property in the goods, uh, then it means that uh, the, set, the buyer did not receive any property because uh, <laughs> the law says that you cannot, uh, that nemo that quantum have you cannot pass what you don't have. So if you don't have the right to pass property, uh, the, the buyer did not receive any property uh, by means of that purported sale. Uh, you know there are instances where um, a seller may not have a right to to sell. For example, uh, if the goods are stolen goods and uh, the goods are sold to another person, uh, the law says that on conviction, that means when the thief is caught and is convicted, the property reinvests back in the in the in the owner. So in that particular instance, a seller does not have a right to pass property in uh, you know in respect of a stolen good so if for example your goods were stolen and was sold to you there will be a breach of uh, this particular provision of section 12 of the uh, sale of goods act because a seller does not have a right to pass property or right to sell uh, goods that are stolen so uh, property will not pass 
you know where the goods are actually stolen goods then um, it therefore means this uh, you know that where the, the there is a breach of this particular condition uh, because this is a condition uh, the, the, the this particular term is a condition the uh, buyer will have a right to repudiate the contract and by repudiation we mean that he will have a right to uh, actually recover the, the the amount of money that was paid you know for that particular goods and uh, actually set the goods the contract aside so uh, that basically will be the remedy available you know because he won't have a right to reject the goods in that sense because the third party who is the owner would ha actually have come to take possession of the goods but uh, in this sense he will have a right to recover whatever uh, you know uh, consideration he has made or paid for that particular goods so that basically is what covers uh, section 12 and also you can claim for damages as well then um, subsection 2 uh, relates to warranty so subsection 1 which talks about the right to sell uh, has to, it's actually a condition so it's a condition that the seller should have a right to sell at the time where he actually made the sale so he should have a right to pass the valid property of the goods at the time in which the sale was made now the subsection 2 and 3 of of uh, section 12 uh, actually relates to warranties in the sense that the breach of these particular provisions will only give uh, the buyer a right to claim for damages it will not give the buyer a right you know to repudiate the contract now these particular uh, subsections uh, provide for uh, warranties uh, the first which is subsection 2 uh, provides a warranty of quiet possession so what we mean by quiet possession means that uh, the possession of the buyer should not be disturbed by either the seller or by a third party. So uh, who has superior, uh, you know, title to the goods. So for example, if the goods were actually stolen goods and the owner comes to recover the goods, you know, your possession is actually being disturbed. So uh, you that your possession of those goods should not actually be disturbed by either the seller himself or by a third party so if the seller says oh I made a mistake uh, you know and he wants to retrieve those goods from you is that because he says I didn't have title to sell those goods you know to you the goods actually don't belong to me and I didn't have the right to sell, uh, sell them uh, you know it actually belongs to a third party so I'm here to recover those goods now he has disturbed your quiet possession of those goods now what the law says in that regard is that you will have a right you know to uh, to obtain damages from that particular seller uh, if a third party does the same you can also sue the seller and obtain damages because your right to quiet possession has been disturbed then the next uh, subsection 3 provides for the warranty of freedom from encumbrances and charges so what we mean by encumbrances we are talking about some lesser rights being created over uh, your the, the property we are talking about certain rights to the goods being given to a third party which is not equivalent or which is lesser than the rights to uh, actually um, of ownership you know the ultimate or the most superior right to a good is the right of ownership but there could be other rights that other persons may have to the goods uh, which may not confer on them the right of ownership but confer on them certain special rights you know to those goods for example uh, if the goods are actually pledged you know to maybe a bank or to a financial institution in exchange for maybe uh, financial or, 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 or credit facilities and uh, in that particular pledge you know uh, you know uh, it was actually stated that if those uh, if that particular uh, financial for, um, facility or credit facility that is given is not repaid back in a period of time uh, the bank will be able to uh, recover the goods and then sell it you know and you know in order to get back its money now what has been created here is not a transfer of ownership but it's a security you have used that good to create security for a loan 
so what you did but ownership was not transferred you know to the, the pledge oh. so it's a lesser right is the security that is created over that particular um over that particular goods is a lesser right than the right of ownership so what we are saying here is that where for example uh, there is maybe the, the goods have been pledged to somebody in exchange as security for maybe some credit facility uh, that means a loan and um, you know uh, you know your possession is disturbed as a result of that or you get to find out about that then uh, you have a right to sue the seller uh, you know for a breach of this particular uh, warranty so it means that the seller should not ordinarily sell to you you know a a, a good upon which uh, some other person has some other special interest in that particular goods so basically uh, this actually is what actually relates to uh, the implied terms as to title now where section that means where there is a breach of the right to sell uh, the remedy at being able to the buyer is as I did say is to repudiate the contract uh, but if he wishes not to repudiate the contract then he can proceed under section 2 to claim for damages and he can now claim for uh, the uh, breach or uh, for the, the breach of the warranty of quiet possession uh, then uh, where it comes to the time in which to bring an action uh, on that section 12 one that's the right to sell um, the uh, buyer was bring uh, the, the, the rather the statute of limitation begins to run from the time of sale uh, while in section uh, 12.2 and 12.3, which is the warranties, um, it actually begins to run when your possession is actually disturbed. Now, let's move on to um, the implied term as to description. The implied term as to description. Sorry, let's just get the... Okay. The implied term as to description now uh, where goods are actually sold by description uh, section 13 of the sale of goods act uh, has actually implied that those goods should correspond to the description you know or you know actually of the goods so uh, where the actual goods when they actually delivered those goods should actually correspond to the description you know contained in the contract now also um, if for example uh, it's also uh, sold by uh, you know by sample as well uh, the goods should not only uh, co correspond to the sample but must also correspond with the description as well so uh, where you sell goods by this uh, by description and a sample is also given to you saying that this particular good you know uh, you, this is a sample of the description of those goods the goods should not only correspond with the sample but must also correspond with the description as well now uh, what do we mean by description description actually uh, refers to words which actually indicate the quality the quantity or any attributes of the goods so that's what we actually mean by description so we are talking about any words that actually uh, indicates the quality the qu uh, quantity or the attributes of the goods now um, there are certain instances where goods are actually sold by description for example, where goods are unascertained, uh, those goods are actually sold by description. So all unascertained goods. So if you're actually buying goods that are unascertained, uh, the goods are actually goods that are sold by description. Or uh, goods that are uh, future goods are actually sold by description. So uh, description will actually apply to that. Then um, where goods, the buyer has not even seen the goods. So any goods that the buyer has not seen, 
uh, is actually something that is a good that has been sold by the scripture. So if the goods have not been seen, but merely the goods, goods were actually described to you, uh, those particular goods are actually described by the scripture. Then also there is a possibility that uh, you there is a possibility that a seller could actually sell goods that the buyer has seen, but uh, nevertheless uh, the sale will still be uh, a, a sale by description. Now this occurs where uh, the description is not apparent, it's not something that can be seen. Uh, that means that the, the goods or what the seller has described uh, in relation to the quality of the goods or the attributes of the goods. It's not something that can be seen, you know, apparently on the body of the goods. So, uh, basically, uh, it's possible to buy uh, goods which uh, the buyer has seen, but that particular uh, purchase will be uh, based on description. Now, where there is a breach of section uh, 13, that means uh, this implied term, uh, the buyer could either claim for damages or he could reject the goods. He could claim for damages if he decides to uh, treat the, uh, the breach as a warranty or he could reject the goods if he decides to treat it as a condition as uh, the law actually provides for it. So uh, he can actually reject the goods. Now let's take a pause here and we'll continue in the next video. Thank you.